presentations in just a few minutes. Um, just one last reminder. If you, uh, what we've seen is that uh, PowerPoint presentations don't always work well um, from the Chromebook. So uh, if, if you have it in PowerPoint, we'll, we'll try to make it work. It's just with mine, it didn't work so well. So uh, it's safer if you, if you use the PDF. And if you have both the PDF and the, the PowerPoint up there, we'll, we'll just choose the, the PDF when it comes your turn. Um, also, what we're going to do is download from the repo all the files so we have them locally here. If you have not uploaded your presentation yet, uh, don't panic. Once we get through uh, presenting all the ones that, that we do have, we'll go back and, and get ones that we missed. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll give everyone a chance to present. And if, if your file's up there and you decide you don't want to present at the time we call you, you can just let us know. Okay, so um, we're going to limit the presentations to three minutes. If you can wrap up in less than three minutes, um, then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, if you go over three minutes, uh, we'll have to cut you off so that we, we, we get through all these. Um, I'll be down here keeping time. I'll, I'll give you a, a signal when you have one minute left, and, uh, and then I'll just let you know when that time's up. Hopefully I, it doesn't get to that point. Uh, Barry's here. He's going to be helping me with going through this, these uh, presentations. Um, and like I said, we have the shared Chromebook up here that, that we'll all be using. We'll give you a little guidance on how to use it. It's, it's fairly straightforward. And bear with us as we're pulling in each of the presentations. Hopefully, we've got it working so it flows pretty well. How we got that? No. I think when you download here, one, maybe here files. Okay, so it's this zip. Oh, I see. To put them all in. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I'll use the default. So. Okay. Excellent. So we could just go through them yep. off the box. And then once we're through, we'll probably have to go and. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to go through these in the order that they happen to get downloaded here. So the first one is, the floor is DNS. So will somebody come up from the floor is DNS and give your presentation? Excuse me? Huh? Okay. We'll we'll do you later. Uh, 
That's not a problem. Not a problem. We'll do you later. Okay. So let's go with the next one. Spin dump. Yeah, it's quite the maze to get up here. After after he's done, I'll try to give the next person a, a cue to move your way to the front of the room before you, uh, you know, so we don't take as much time. All right, so just use the left okay. and right keys to. Okay, um, so here's the presentation of the quick measurements table and our project we call Spin Dump. So <coughs> we've been working for a couple of ITFs on this uh, Spin Dump tool. It's a uh, network latency measurement tool basically uh, that looks at quick and other protocols um, today we had some ideas of implementing some experimental proposals for measuring packet loss <coughs> uh, so there are a few different proposals out on using some of the reserved bits in the short header of the quick packets um, so <coughs> we needed also to create some sort of unified handling of quick versions because we now start to see a lot of different versions and dif different uses of these experimental bits. And uh, yeah, that's basically what we tried to do. And what got done was that we made a table-driven version of experimental and uh, non-experimental quick versions. We implemented two drafts of these loss measurement bits. And we are currently developing sort of uh, reporting of loss measurement events in our tool. Um, <coughs> We're also integrating this into some testing environments, uh, using it, uh, for instance, a Mininet test VM that we can use to test a lot of different network uh, scenarios, basically. We also did a bunch of uh, bug fixes. Uh, this is uh, a list of how we are handling different quick versions. So uh, previously, we had kind of nasty structures where different behaviors based on different quick versions uh, Basically, we had to go into every function and, 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 and check which version it is. Now we have generalized this quite nicely so, so that we can add new experimental versions with new support for different header formats, etc., cetera, and, and yeah, make it much more dynamic and nice. And uh, right. yeah, left and right. Uh, <coughs> so some of the loss detection proposals that got implemented was um, one that is based on uh, this Q and R bits that will be presented at uh, map RG. Uh, so we have that implemented. And we also have this uh, round trip loss measurements uh, as well. Uh, <coughs> so we have a bunch of proposals in there. What did we learn was that uh, supporting all quick versions is, is quite demanding. It's quite demanding to, especially when we have a protocol that's evolving and we have a lot of experimental proposals, to have a nice structure of, of, of handling you know, all of these different cases. Um, <coughs> we see that bo both uh, these loss detection proposals have measurements in real networks, and we hope to be able to, to facilitate more measurements of this. Uh, but yeah, problem is that we only have two reserved bits, and two reserved bits for two proposals is quite not not that much. <laughs> um, so this was done with uh, me, Mark Zillar, uh, Yari Arco, Sylvester, Fabio, Maru, and Alexandre. Uh, you can find our tool, the Spin Dump, at at GitHub, uh, and the new measurements uh, uh, proposals you can find at these links. So yeah, that's it. Okay, thanks. Let's uh, go on to the Okay, PTP notifications is next and kickoff uh, nope, sorry. Uh IOAM, make your way to the front so we don't waste time. Okay, use the right and left buttons. To okay. Hi, my name is Sachin. Uh, please use the mic. Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Sachin Vishwarupe. I am from Cisco System, and 
myself and Ufaz, we worked on the PTP notification. I am for the first time for ITF, as you can see, as you can see, I have not used the format and maybe next time we'll follow the same thing. So essentially in Cisco, I work on IP fabric as some of you may or may not be aware, but these days the paradigm on the media also is changing. It's moving away from the standard SDI to IP based fabrics. And that's what we work on. One of the key things there is the PTP is the synchronization between the your media gateways, endpoints, as well as the video audio sync is very critical. And the accuracy needs to be less than 500 nanosecond. And that's the reason we use PTP. With the PTP today, we actually have, as I noticed, we have the standard for the YANG already defined, like RFC 8575. But what is more critical for us to is to get the notification. And that's because of the number of things which are involved in the PTP. In the PTP, like in the precision time protocol, in a second, we typically sync eight times. So we cannot expect network management system to sync and find out the deviation from those samples. Because if you think about one day for a single switch, we generate around 700,000 uh, sample points. And so we want to do it in a distributed fashion. So what we are thinking is to extend what we have it today with the PTP Yang to introduce like a new notification there. Okay, this slide again talks about the synchronization. I mean, earlier when we started on the audio video, right, if you are using a, a lower signal or maybe think about like ultra HD, HD, 4K, 8K, now the buffer cannot be that big, right? So that's the reason synchronization is critical. I put some more things, but more importantly, you can think like audio and video needs to be in sync. And that's what uh, we have been working on. So these are the use cases uh, what we wanted to address it in the hackathon. So essentially for the live event, we wanted to monitor and monitor via notification. Again, depending upon the media profile, the, the duration and the state, all those parameters need to vary. And that's where again, we wanted to do the configuration as well as generate the notification. Sure. So in the hackathon, we have uh, the deliverables. We defined uh, today like a PTP Yang notification model. Again, we need to review with the team. We develop a uh, third party application on Cisco switch. So the real deliverable here was a Python script, which will uh, consume on the switch and push it as a Yang notification to the existing product. We have like a network management solution and we extended that to introduce a new REST API to consume that notification and overlay the PTP information on top. So I mean, it's kind of eye chart, but I, I'm, sh I'm sharing the slides so you can see the example payload as well as notification. And this is how the user interface looks like. Uh, here, what you are seeing is a spine leaf topology with Cisco switches. And based upon the PTP offset threshold, the switches at the runtime are color coded. So based on the notification, which WebSocket, it dynamically updates the screen. So based on the number of sample which has deviated, uh, we actually color code those. And this was just an idea just to demo that part. And this is the backend where we introduced like a, a new application on the backend with the Python script, which completely integrates with the Cisco CLI. So it's as if like a original part of the Cisco, it's coming from Cisco and you can monitor and control the notification part of it. So that was the idea. The whole idea is to take the notification and integrate into the PTP. Thank you. Okay, IOAM is up and ILNP is on deck. So this was a uh, project to do IOAM, which is in situ OAM, Operations and Management. Uh, basic idea, if you're not familiar, is to have an IPv6 extension header, hop a hop option that contains uh, an IOAM option, which is information that the router fills in as the packet goes along its path. So the ideas were taking metrics and uh, performance measurements from routers in a path. 
So the goal we had uh, today and yesterday was to implement uh, something and, and show some interoperability. There's a couple of drafts uh, on the IOAM. Uh, one is on the specific option, one is on the data format. And what we did, uh, we brought up uh, UDP ping, just a little um, program to do a UDP ping that sets the extension header and the IOAM option. And we had a client server, one router, and we were able to uh, follow the path and have the uh, information filled in. The kernel implementation or the router uh, was provided by Justin. That's at this GitHub. And separately, the client and the server code was a different implementation. All of these were on Linux. Uh, hopefully, next IETF hackathon, we'll have some more um, router or host implementations join in. So the way this works um, for what we did, uh, we ping a remote host, add a few options. And as you can see, we got some response back. And we parsed the IOM message that we got back. And sure enough, the router filled it in. So um, more interestingly is the node information. This is directly from the IOM uh, draft, various pieces of information. So I have the egress interface, ingress interface, timestamps, transit delay, uh, things like that. So there's quite a bit of information uh, that we could potentially uh, gather from the network in this fashion. So uh, we did learn a few things, uh, particularly trying to, to get things to interoperate. Uh, getting the lengths right uh, when we're parsing fields, um, particularly fields that hold lengths that correlate to other lengths, uh, that was kind of interesting. Bit fields don't make things easier in this regard, especially when they're split across uh, byte boundaries. And we also have a few suggestions to IPPM, particularly in some of the data formatting, uh, opaque data format, for instance. It's a lot easier to deal with fixed fields uh, than variable length data in this regard. So we probably have uh, some good feedback on that. Um, wrapping it up, so we had uh, a good um, number of team members and a couple of first timers at IETF Hackathon. Thank you. Okay, ILNP is up and TAPS is on deck. Okay, so just um, some background information on um, ILMP. We had the first demo of what will eventually be a public release of the code at the last IETF. And we've just been uh, developing that, especially trying to fix some bugs that we found in uh, at IETF 104, which was very useful to, to know about. So the plan here was really to make sure that ILMP could work over a, a real network. That's the uh, idea eventually. And so what we had was um, a network that consisted of some uh, low-end uh, routers, but they are just commercial routers. They run IPv6 only. The idea is that ILNP works completely end-to-end, -end, so the core routers just think you're running IPv6, whereas actually you're running uh, ILNP. And the other thing that came through a fortuitous conversation with Stefan Bortzmeyer was some DNS improvements that help uh, with DNS um, in general, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about those in a slide coming up. So these are the key things that we managed to work out today. We did some test runs with TCP over ILNP running over these uh, commercial routers between two boxes that were running an ILNP modified uh, Linux kernel, and um, but running over these uh, commercial routers. And we had some discussions on fixing uh, a possible issue with DNS uh, additional information processing, uh, and that was actually fixed, so that was a, a good outcome. Uh, I spoke to Stefan Bortzmeyer, and after I uploaded these slides, uh, I should also thank, uh, so I didn't put his name in, but Peter Spatchik actually did the coding to put this fix into uh, one of the, the DNS servers, so thank you for that uh, as well. Um, this is the demo that we ha had running. We had uh, the, it's not very easy to see, but you've got two boxes at the, um, what is your right-hand edge running the island P code. And in the middle, we've got four uh, little edge router boxes. Uh, those are R1, R2, R3, uh, marked in the logical diagram. 
and we emulated a mobile node moving across them. So no mobile uh, IP there, just unicast routing. And what uh, happened is that as the mobile node moves across, it's running a TCP flow from uh, the blue node, the correspondent node, while it moves. And we just wanted to see, can Island P do what it's meant to do, which is to change its location uh, uh, seamlessly as it moves across those different networks. And the, the results we had showed um, here on this graph, the individual throughput on the network shown on the top three facets of the graph. And on the bottom graph is just the aggregate throughput you see at the correspondent node. So that was pretty good. We got a consistent TCP flow running across those commercial routers running Island P end-to-end. Uh, -end. They were just running unicast routing, but we uh, had a mobile node. Um, this was work that was done mainly by my PhD student uh, who's working with me at the... Uh, that's saying my time is up, <laughs> um, at the University of St. Andrews, and we had some former students who also contributed some code, and just some thanks to some people who've made it possible uh, for me to be here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I2NSF is next, and TAP is now. TAPS is now. Hi. Hi, I'm Teresa. I'm presenting for the TAPS table, which is for transport services. Just a quick recap what TAPS is. So we are developing a sort of an abstract API for different transport protocols. And those are just the transport protocols our current PyTAPS implementation supports. Of course, it will be nice to have Quick in there as well. So the idea is the application specifies some abstract requirements and then it gets a generic connection and the application doesn't have to care whether it's like a new transport protocol. It, and uh, this is being um, worked on by the TAPS working group right now in those three drafts. Now in our PyTabs implementation, we added a few things here at the hackathon. So um, we have tests now and um, we worked on racing between different transport protocols. So of course, those are not really equivalent, but if we have transport protocols that are sort of provide the same features, then we can try them at the same time and sort of go happy eyeballs on them. And we are um, working on that right now. Also, we are working on getting multicast to work, which is a kind of work in progress. Also, we have a nice, uh, interesting concept called framers. So the idea is you get a byte stream from TCP, but then you have a sort of a delimiter that delimits your byte stream into messages. And this is a concept that has been added to or that has been expanded in the recent draft. And so we've been discussing framers a lot. And there's also going to be uh, more discussion on this concept in the working group. So we have some feedback because in our implementation we have implemented it and some parts were unclear. Also, we're going to discuss how much we of this we have to specify. From the tests, we could um, fix some bugs in our implementation, obviously, but also we are sort of modeling the input that we get from the application. And maybe also we're going to model the output, sort of the resulting connection. So let's see where this leads in terms of comparing different implementations. And on also we have some other minor additions to the draft. So uh, the people who were there the entire weekend are mostly um, Jake, Max and me. Also we had uh, more discussions with people from the working group, Philip and Tommy for example. And so thank you for, um, thank you to everybody who contributed to that. And this is the link to our repo. Okay, I2NSF now, and uh, SRV6VPN Yang next. Okay, left and right button. Okay. Hello, uh, hello this is uh, Paul Zhang from uh, SKKU in Korea. Uh, let me uh, introduce I2NSF Framework Hackathon uh, Project this time. Left and right. Okay. Okay, you can see. Okay. So this time, um, I too, and I have a hackathon project. We want to uh, prove concept. Uh, the person over uh, I two and I have a framework can work 
on top of a commercial public cloud uh, platform. It is called the um, SOA. You can see um, security on air. So we approved our um, three interfaces on top of uh, this uh, commercial platform. And also we um, demonstrated the security policy uh, translator is uh, works well. So this is a building um, block. And so uh, this shows the uh, internet raft um, at I2 NSA working group. And this is a poster. So this is our uh, during the weekend we work together, team portal. So this uh, figure uh, shows uh, I2NSF. So uh, this is uh, the nice I2NSF uh, framework uh, project. So, so you may be uh, familiar with uh, this one. So this time uh, we embarked uh, with commercial uh, buyer uh, NSF. So here uh, with buyer and also we uh, used the um, Previously, uh, we used the uh, Shurikata uh, open source uh, um, the web filter. So this time we combined the commercial uh, power and open source uh, Shurikata for uh, web filter together on top of a commercial public cloud system developed by the ATR in Korea. And so uh, the slide uh, demonstrate Mm, a couple of, uh, yeah, you can see demonstration here. So the register, the NSF features, and also consumer uh, interface used to uh, deliver the security policy in the high level point of view. And then uh, security controller translate uh, high level policy into low level policy. So this is, uh, see, you can see uh, one you see is one you get. So we uh, provide uh, user interface to easily configure that to security functions using uh, the, this dashboard. Yeah, OK. So we provided two uh, scenarios, uh, filtering and web filter. So this time, we prove a concept, uh, I2NSF uh, interfaces working on top of a commercial platform. Also, uh, we show that the translator is working well. So uh, tomorrow, uh, hack demo, uh, uh, our we can uh, demonstrate. Uh, uh, we'll be happy with uh, your visit. Thank you for your yeah, listening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, SRV6 VPN Yang, and uh, coming up is LP1. Hi, this is Hi, this is Michael, and uh, uh, I will introduce the uh, hack project of uh, uh, SRV6 VPN configuration generally module. Uh, yes, this is our hack plan, and we know we already deployed uh, SRV6 uh, VPN and configure SRV6 VPN uh, uh, CRI or native uh, SRV6 unit module. And the standard SRV6 module is under development by ITF. So we're looking forward a uh, path to support the operator's uh, controller use ITF Young module to interact with vendors native Young to uh, and that to deployment on the uh, Lexi device. And so the project here is we using the Ansible playbook and the ITF Young data modules to configuration to config SRV6 VPN and implement the key features in uh, ITF SRV6 module. Also, we want to develop and uh, also we want to develop and um, plug in to support uh, standard young model to translate to uh, native model. Uh, sorry. Okay, this is what we can. Uh, we got we got <coughs> what we got now, uh, and then we implement uh, three uh, Ansible APIs: uh, one for uh, SRV6 global uh, and uh, SS SRV6 and SRV6 VPN mode. And we also developed an uh, app to allow the command ITF module to the vendor native Young module. You can input it ITF, uh, ITF SRV6 base module, and the output is a native uh, SRV6 module. And here is a function and the f workflow. For the new device, you can directly implement the uh, ITF module 
and uh, for the legacy device, you can use a, a plugin to translate the standard model to the native model. Uh, and what we learned is that um, Active uh, Service 6 module can deploy to support the Service 6 uh, service delivery, and we use Ansible playbook to orchestrate multiple tests. And uh, here's the problem is that the vendor legacy device may be only support native young model, and uh, the operator or uh, controller may want to deploy the ITF standard model as a common interface to in uh, interact with multiple vendors. So we uh, develop an uh, app to uh, address this issue, and it works well. If uh, and if okay, if you like to. Uh, if you are interested in this topic, uh, you can join tomorrow's uh, happy hours, and uh, we will show the demo and discuss the detail. Okay, this is our team member. Uh, thanks everyone's uh, contribution. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, LP1 is now, and uh, PBT is coming up next. Good afternoon. This is a report for the from the LP1 open check table down in the back. Um, so at this uh, hackathon, similar to the previous few uh, hackathons, our goal was to improve the open source implementation of Check. Uh, Check is a protocol defined at the LP1 working group. Uh, it's about compressing headers and providing fragmentation so that uh, IP protocols can be transported over LP1s. And LP1s are low power wide area networks such as uh, LoRaWAN, uh, Sigfox, uh, NBR UT, LTM, or IEEE 15.4W, uh, which are characterized by very small payloads and uh, very reduced bandwidth and uh, energy um, resources. Um, the major draft is the first one shown here, and we have a few continuation drafts. So what we got done t uh, this weekend was uh, merge uh, several feature branches in our project. We had had uh, separate developments over the last few months, um, and which resulted in basically the compression being in one branch and fragmentation in another branch. And so we merged that uh, so that they are now fully integrated. Um, and we got the basic tests running again and a few details to be <laughs> run out yet. Um, and one of the branch provides in the new um, uh, fragmentation mode that was introduced last fall, including uh, extensive uh, testing of that. We added a few other functionalities, so simple OAM uh, stuff like ping responses and all that stuff. Um, so that one uh, major achievement, and the other one is making the, the project easier to use for newcomers. Uh, so we created a user guide how you really uh, run the code simply when you get started. Uh, we added that into the Sphinx documentation of the project and we also wrote a uh, test plan for to do random testing of the fragmentation uh, machine. Oops. Um, so yeah, what we learned is that uh, it's uh, easy to diverge on such projects when you have contributors overseas that you quite don't know beforehand. Uh, we also want, uh, we really want to lower the adoption barrier to this uh, project so that newcomers can get used to it without uh, draining too much of uh, the resources of the old timers. Um, and also, yeah, we want to provide complete examples and we want to become the reference implementation for Sheik. And that's our team, 10 members, one new uh, hackathon member, uh, three people remote from Japan, Spain, and Chile, which uh, allowed us to run 24-7 over this weekend by having the Japanese guy working while we were sleeping. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, PBT is coming up, and the next one after that is IP Wave.
Ah, okay, we have a PPT. Let's see how well that works. Hmm. Click on present. Click on present. Uh, yes, of course. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can't. I'm not. A, I'm not able to advance it. Um, hmm. Okay. So we're, we've asked PBT to upload a PDF, and we'll come back to it. So for now, uh, IP Wave and Art Arts to You is after that. So uh, this is a uh, Paul Jung. Um, so uh, I want to share uh, the experience IP wave project, basic product uh, protocol project. So the goal is to want to uh, prove the uh, IP uh, version 6 over L2.11 OCB uh, wave, IEEE wave uh, logical link layer. The second one is a vehicular neighbor discovery uh, with uh, address restoration and multi-hop uh, DAD. And also, we take advantage of intermediate uh, vehicles in Bennett to reduce uh, DAD time. Also, we can um, uh, short the initi initialization of TCP uh, UDP transmission. So we uh, proved the two draft OCB and also vehicular neighbor discovery draft. So this is a poster. This is uh, the portal, uh, the team. So this is, uh, figure is the vehicular network architecture. So you can see vehicle can communicate each other using V2B, also communicate the V2I. So our idea is uh, you can see the vehicle, uh, even though it is not a uh, communication range of a uh, roadside unit, this is uh, uh, providing uh, internet connectivity to vehicle. So it can initiate uh, DAD using intermediate vehicle and register using multi app DAD and also it once it uh, configured with a uh, global IP ad address, it can start the TCP UDP connection. So we approved using uh, simulation. Uh, this figure shows a sumo for uh, load simulator. And also we uh, uh, use the OMNet for network simulator. So you can see uh, we uh, using a three hop, uh, multi-hop DAD to reduce the DAD delay. And also we can start the quickly uh, TCP connection. So this is a protocol stack. Uh, the left hand side is, a, um, you can see wave protocol stack. This is IP. This is a web sort message protocol for safety. So we implemented for a logical link layer and IP version 6 uh, over to the 11, also neighbor discovery. So, so the uh, simulation result is our neighbor discovery can reduce the legacy uh, neighbor discovery. So yeah, okay. So uh, we during uh, the weekend we uh, learned the probe concept, uh, IP wave, uh, OCB, and uh, vehicle neighbor discovery uh, can work for the multi uh, vehicle network. So uh, you can uh, take a look uh, the other material for uh, video clip and also GitHub uh, link. Thank you for your listening. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, arts to you now, and um, TLS 1.3 SSH, come on up for next. Use the left and right. Left and right. So left forward. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, uh, arts to You is a feed of arts and culture listings. Uh, we're looking to save the producers of arts events time and, and to help them bypass the intermediaries who have kind of taken over the, uh, their data. So we want to improve the discovery and circulation of the arts events while we're here at ITF, and we want to make the arts more machine readable. So uh, the problem is that the arts 
sector publishes its information in very fragmented ways, uh, and regrettably, intermediaries, inter intermediaries have become the authorities of our compiled arts data. So uh, what we did here, uh, step one was a lot of preliminary data organization, and step two was we constructed widgets to, for the users, uh, for public users to indicate their interest. And once the, once the games were made, that helped us uh, log the results and feed uh, different information to the users. So, uh, so the before picture of this, as it is on, on the website, you see all the arts events that are listed there uh, where the user has not made any preferences. And then uh, the user plays one of two, two of the games we created. And then in the end, uh, we have recommended events for, for the user and then the user can um, play the game again and we can learn more about the user. So uh, for the outcomes, uh, we have begun organizing uh, our system uh, to uh, take into account these user preferences. And uh, there's a lot more discussion, a lot more data needs to be generated before we can implement any of this. And uh, we have uh, some questions going forward and I'm happy to speak with anyone who wants to know about this project. Okay, thank you very much. All right, TLS 1.3 and uh, mud onboarding is after that. And this uh, looks like TLS 1.3 is another PowerPoint. So let me give that another try. They wanted to go at the end. All right. Okay. Yep. I've also update, uploaded the PDF. Okay. So we'll catch you at the end when we do, when we catch up on the uploads. So mud onboarding. No worries. Mud onboarding is now, and then DHCP v6 after that. Left and right buttons. Okay, hi everybody. Um, well, uh, it wasn't just mud onboarding. We uh, muddled in uh, Anima ACP work on, on that as well. Um, a couple of different drafts that are uh, going on uh, here. So we have the uh, RFC 8520, and we had a lot of projects running around at that center table there. Um, we had work on a mud, uh, mud reporter. This is a mechanism by which uh, uh, manufacturers and network administrators can learn whether or not their uh, devices are actually putting out uh, policy recommendations that are useful to those devices or if there's a misconfiguration. Uh, some work on MudMaker, which generates the JSON. Uh, the, the guys from Sierra Labs completely redid the code, uh, which was nice because it was in PHP and my PHP, which is really bad. Um, and now it's all in Python, thank you guys. Um, there was DPP MUD integration that was going on. Uh, there was a verification mechanism uh, that was being developed uh, by the folks at NCCOE. Um, and uh, then we had some grasp work uh, and, dis and discovery work going on. Um, uh, and uh, let's see here. Uh, what did we plan to solve? Well, actually, we just planned to all get together and figure out what to solve, and that's what we did. Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of I, I think I covered a lot of this ground already. Um, on mud, on, on mud reporting, uh, we got a guy back there, Ranga, who, who sat there and, and basically coded the entire time, and got an 80% uh, implementation in terms of uh, what he can report out. Um, and uh, we had a lot of bug fixes going on too, uh, to a bunch of this stuff. Uh, the mud manager that uh, Cisco did uh, had a loop in it, and uh, it still has a loop in it, but at least we know where it is and know how to avoid it. And uh, I'll be putting in a patch for that. In fact, I have a patch already, it just needs to get committed. Um, so uh, we had a lot of, uh, some interoperability testing going on. We had a, a couple of guys here from CECOM who went and actually implemented MUD right on the spot in their devices um, and test against a number of MUD managers, generated themselves a MUD file that was appropriate and tested their access. Uh, we can now test their access. Um, and uh, then we had uh, some ad additional integration going on in terms of filters for east-west versus north-south in terms of the verification code. and. Um, yeah, we got a lot of work going on. So um, we know also we need to fail fast. We have uh, on, on some of our code and we have a lot of work to do on the mud reporter. Uh, just a couple of screenshots of uh, some of the stuff that went on here. This is the, the, the uh, thing that will generate mud files in terms of the verification. 
Um, and here you got here you have Darshak and our gentleman from CECOM in, in terms of them bringing their hardware that implemented MUD either in DPP or directly uh, using uh, things. And here's the long list of people who actually did a lot of work. And thanks to a bunch of uh, organizations who are supporting them. Thank you. And it looks like a lot of first timers on this one, so that's great. Yeah. Okay, um, DHCP v6 PD, and then uh, Coin RG after that. Okay, so hi. Uh, this was a spontaneous project. Um, as you may have known, um, there's DHCP v6 PD on the hack of the network, and I got chatting with people. And I put together code for FR routing to capture those packets, uh, pick up the appropriate routes, uh, and install them. That wasn't previously possible. Now it is. And uh, that's it. Okay. And we have a new record for shortest presentation. Thanks. Um, OK, so CoinRG and MapRG after that. The right, the right button to go forward, left to go back. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm sorry we didn't use the, uh, the format. Uh, in Quebec, we call that being a distinct society. Uh, this is the Coin RG uh, P4 um, hackathon. And this was our first one, as you can see, because we didn't know about the format. Uh, who are we? We're actually a proposed research group. We're still uh, waiting to be a real one. But we want to look at everything that works, that deals with uh, computing and the network and uh, investigating this whole continuum of putting computation from um, the data center all the way to the edge. Uh, we want to look at architectures, we want to look at protocols, and we want to look at real world use cases. And this is the reason that we're having this hackathon because there's a bunch of people who invented a language, it's called P4. Uh, which is currently being used to do some uh, specific programming and switches. And we wanted to look at this idea of this cloud to edge computing continuum in P4. We didn't have a specific project except our remote participant. Uh, most of us were pretty much uh, new users. And because of that, we have to really give a shout to the company, the Montreal company, who sent us two engineers for two days to help us uh, setting up our environments and developing. Uh, the code that act is actually at the end, we ended up doing real work, which is like, yay. Um, so what we did, and yes, Remy and Pierre, we are gone, but hey, thank you guys. Um, we did the basic examples. We had actually one very, very proficient, sadly, a remote participant who actually implemented and started implementing an IPv6 V6 switch machine learning uh, in, uh, in P4. Uh, he checked his, uh, his code in the... Um, in the GitHub, and it's related to a work that was done before in IPv4. Uh, we had actually, we actually poached uh, people from other tables actually who joined us. Uh, we had 12 participants at the end, so that was actually pretty surprising for us. And uh, the, p the people who we poached uh, included people who started looking at P4 to Golang. Uh, and this morning we did uh, packet filtering and we gathered a ton of information and I'm always done. And so our next steps, uh, we want to continue gathering projects. We think that uh, you know we have a good chance to become a real research group, so we would like to have a coin interim. And we want to have another hackathon in Singapore because we really got the heck of this. And we would like to really, really thank uh, the hackathon organizers and our helpers and our participants. Thank you very much. Okay, map RG now and um, it's hackathon measurements is next. It's left and right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So the measurement analysis for protocols uh, research group uh, participated in our third hackathon this time, and I'll tell you what we were up to. Um, the problem that we were attacking on uh, uh, at this meeting, or uh, uh, during this hackathon rather, was to produce a reference implementation for doing IP address aggregation. Um, two applications of this are doing um, address-based uh, 
anonymization, where we a where you aggregate, say, your IPv4 address to a slash 24, what do you do with IPv6? Another application of it is, for instance, to find homogenous populations, for instance, for content delivery networks to do matchmaking between the users and the content. Uh, the specific problem to solve was how do we take something like a Patricia tree, if, if you use Python or Perl, you know this as NetPatricia, or in Python, PyRadix, or PyTricia, um, how do you use a data structure like that to represent all the activity in the entire internet? It's too big when you have tens of billions or hundreds of billions of v6 addresses. So, um, so the, the, to solve it, we decided to take uh, an existing code base in C, the Aguri tree, which is an implementation of Patricia tree, and make portions of the tree immutable. And I'll show you why that solved the problem. But basically, it allows you to solve the problem by partitioning it. You can partition the set of addresses arbitrarily into small sets. You can put them on a cluster. And you produce an intermediate result where you can capture the state of the tree as you're performing some operation on it and then do it um, iteratively. So. So, uh, well, what were the new ideas and what did the team agree on? Well, the team, it turns out today, was just me, so we agreed on everything and we agreed to use the Aguri tree and we agreed that this, this, parti this partitioning problem could be solved by making portions of the tree immutable. So that's the new, the novel design idea in a Patricia tree. Uh, the GitHub upload is pending and I'll, show, I'll just show you exactly what it was because we managed to get it, we managed to get it done in just a day. So um, what we got done, so imagine you have a set of active addresses, here's 10 uh, IPv6 slash 64s, and you can punch them up into one of these trees that are commonly used, it's kind of like a routing table. So we put, the tree, we put them in the tree, the leaf nodes are all those active addresses, and then we run some operation, which I call a Gurify, which aggregates them in some useful way based on your selection criteria. Like let's say I, I only want aggregates that it represent at least 32 of, the, of those active users. Well, the problem is if you run it the old way, it'll aggregate up the whole tree because there was nothing there. So the, the simple idea is I just bound the tree or I put in immutable entries and, immu and, and basically make a horizon or a border on the tree here, here measured in red. And so when I run an operation like, an, uh, like a, an aggregation, it's bounded by that red portion and we get a result, uh, an intermediate result that I can then do iteratively, like say on a MapReduce cluster with hundreds of machines. And then, so to, to give you an example why this is important, you probably think in IPv4 you know what a slash 24 is. In IPv6, even with this small data set of 180,000 active slash 64s, this shows that about half of them reach this sufficient aggregation at slash 56, but another half of them needed to be aggregated at slash 40. And today in the v6 internet, a lot of people use slash 48, which is right in the middle and a horrible compromise because you could have a better answer or you're not, not aggregating enough. So um, uh, what we learned is, uh, is that uh, this is a candidate best practice and we'll carry it to the working group. And uh, I made a couple design, other design decisions again that were unanimous. So it was just me I, based on uh, publicly available open source code from uh, some colleagues, uh, including Kinjiro Cho. And uh, we're going to meet on Friday, and I'll, I'll go over some more of the results. Uh, so join us on Friday at MapRG, if you can, in the morning. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, measurements. Uh, just the 105, okay. Got it. And use the left and right buttons. The left and right, okay. So hi, I'm, I'm Al Morton, and um, uh, I, I led a, a champion to project today on uh, measurement uh, using UDP uh, to measure IP link capacity. And uh, we had Len Chavitone remote, and four first timers who all joined the project because we put the asterisk next to the name. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. All right, so here's the plan. Uh, we have this uh, metric and method of measurement. Uh, we have the draft up uh, ready for a five-minute talk in IPPM uh, Wednesday, I think it is. Uh, our, our goal here was to gain UDP-based measurement experience with a git busy one gigabit access at IETF. Everybody knows how busy that can be. And, and additional access types uh, were made possible by our volunteers that joined. And uh, I just want to mention that uh, you know all the names here, Ryan Hoffman from TELUS, and Ryan's going to speak a little bit about his results. And uh, Timothy Carlin, Marion Dillon, and Kyle, Kyle Ouellette, uh, all from UNH at the Interoperability Lab. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay. So um, 
uh, here we go. Uh, so we ran the tests. We iterated some measurement parameters. Uh, we're going to revise the tool based on what we learned and compare with the commercial tool. Uh, everybody knows what that commercial tool is. It's OOKLAS. So uh, we, we, uh, we ran from here side by side uh, for the tests that I ran uh, to the UDP server in um, uh, Middletown, New Jersey, both servers and clients on the same machines. And here's a, a quick res res representative set of results. Uh, with the UDP speed test, uh, uh, you know, we're seeing the effects of, of the traffic here. We're only getting into the 800. I mean, it's a, it's a gigabit per second access, right? Uh, we're we're uh, getting in 800, uh, 650. Ookla measuring a lot lower. Uh, we go back and measure with UDP ST, and now we got a lot closer to the limit of, of one gigabit per second. Um, and then in the afternoon on Saturday, everybody was pounding away here, and we really need to learn the signature of what that, that is. Uh, and my time went away. What the hell? Oh, there it is. Oh, my gosh. It's only 46 seconds left. Uh, go, go. <laughs> So I wanted to include uh, non-congested links. So set up a connection between our TELUS lab at Edmonton, Alberta, with Al's New Jersey lab to perform the same kind of test, but in bulk. So I'm using two servers here in New Jersey just to be able to get the bulk of tests that we needed. Unfortunately, the server uh, in New Jersey only had a GUI. So this shows the comparative results, a consistent near gig speed result with the UDP speed test as opposed to the TCP test, which was highly variable. Really important information for us, because it's difficult for a technician that's going into a home, selling a service, and using that test to reveal to the customer what their achievable speed is and it being subpar. And, and, the, and the, the UNH folks walked in this morning, got this test running, and, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and resolved the problem with their uh, uh, router screening in the, in the firewall on, on UDP traffic. And, and uh, made it work uh, properly right after that. It was a, a great effort in just a few hours here this morning. Um, and we learned a lot of stuff for potential development. And, and, and um, you know, uh, you can learn a lot from testing different access types, that's for sure. Thanks very much. Okay, so I think that's all we have downloaded. Let me go grab the new ones. Yeah. Okay, which um Yeah, let me see. Twenty nine did we do DNS S D discovery prox what? Yeah. So DNS S D discovery proxy. Hello, I'll make this really fast. So we're here working on making discovery work with less use on multicast because multicast. We're here making discovery work with less reliance on multicast because multicast is slow, it's unreliable, it's wasteful of shared wireless spectrum. There's a list here of the drafts. The discovery proxy is based on the hybrid draft which uses DNS push notifications, which in turn builds on DNS stateful operations. We've been building op code for OpenWRT, running on these little GL INET AR750S little pocket gigabit router. I was here working with Ted, and Barbara joined us. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, we did a bunch of work with integration, OpenWRT package management, dealing with asynchronous change notifications with UBUS to really polish this code. This is all available on the ITF Hackathon GitHub, and uh, we now have pre-built packages. You can download it yourself and run this, and in about five minutes, have your own discovery proxy running at home. Thank you. Okay, uh, WebRTC, and then it looks like PBT is after that.
All right. Hey, my name is uh, Alexandre Guayar, and it's a very difficult name to say, so people call me Dr. Alex. I will represent the, the team here about WebRTC. WebRTC is a technology to bring real-time communication, audio, video, and data to the web, and it has a IETF pendant, which is RTC web for all the protocols, the encryption, the security, the codec, and so on. The last missing piece is called simulcast, which is the capacity to send uh, different resolution of audio and video uh, simultaneously uh, over the wire to um, finish the spec at W3C. So some of us came around here today to try to push that uh, so that we can finally have a finalized spec and people can implement product on top of them. We had two browsers represented today, uh, um, Firefox and um, Chrome. Uh, the two others were excused for visa reason and other things. We had free media server represented to give feedback on implementation, which is also very important. And finally, free application vendors that were using both browsers and media servers to help uh, communicate about the needed and missing functionalities and different bugs. Um, we had different people going at it at a different angle. Some of us uh, just took some bugs and went through it. But globally, it was a very uh, efficient session. We went through 10 different bugs in different uh, browsers. And we also helped different vendors implement simulcast in their media server, or at least make progress there, and provide feedback to, to the missing pieces. So um, all in all, very efficient session. Uh, we're very happy. And we made a lot of progress in two days that would otherwise not have been possible uh, without the opportunity to have a face-to-face -face the hackathon gave us. So thanks to the sponsor and uh, thanks to Charles. Okay, um, the PBT. My name is Lucy. Yeah, today I will introduce the, my project postcard based telemetry for in situ flow information telemetry. At first, uh, I will introduce what is the postcard based telemetry. Uh, as we know, uh, there already ha uh, there have already been defined four data types uh, in IETF draft uh, IOM data. Uh, including two type uh, tra tracing, two tracing type, uh, one POT and uh, uh, the last is uh, H2H type. Now uh, we will define another new one, uh, tracing type, uh, called, uh, we call it uh, postcard based telemetry. So what's the difference between the postcard based uh, uh, telemetry uh, and uh, the RM uh, tracing type. At first, uh, we separate the telemetry instru uh, instruction header and the metadata. So like, the, uh, like this uh, picture show, uh, the red one is the instructor and uh, the yellow one is the metadata. Uh, postcard will shape, the metadata will shape out a uh, hop by hop at each node. Uh, so the host as a collector will get uh, the postcard metadata. Uh, why? Then uh, I will tell why we uh, introduced this new type. Uh, because uh, we list uh, three reasons. Uh, the first is detect, uh, use this type, uh, tracing type, we can detect the location of the packet loss. And, uh, uh, and then we can uh, solve the encapsulator, uh, encapsulation length uh, with a fixed packet header. 
sorry, <laughs> little nervous. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the last one is a different the queue's priority from the for the metadata from user traffic. Uh, and then um, the and then uh, the I fit header definition as shown in this diagram uh, aligned uh, for octet aligned. Uh, they are a little different from the uh, IOM type, the IOM header. Uh, there is no length bit and uh, uh, there is no metadata. Uh, okay. Um, this page shows this project in Hexon. Uh, at first, uh, um, there are a uh, network domain include four routers, uh, and uh, a tester will send uh, two test flows, uh, and and also receive uh, these two uh, test flows in IPv6 transport as the transport protocol. Uh, the router four as the ingress uh, node to encapsulate the IFIT header uh, and uh, the mm, router three as the uh, as the uh, egress node to decapsulate uh, the IFIT header uh, and uh, router six and the router five as the transit nodes. Uh, the yellow yellow one is the metadata is collected to the collector. Uh, the collector framework uh, is circled by the dash line. Uh, okay. uh, we built the collector framework uh, based on the open source, open source project. Uh, for example, the Kafka as a distribute message queues and uh, uh, the radius as the memory DB, uh, and then the grandfana as the GUI. Uh, so we collect all the metadata uh, and uh, sh and uh, uh, program to show uh, the following three case. Uh, at first uh, is the delay delay monitor uh, for each node and link and the end to end. Uh, we can see from this um, black panel, yeah, uh, on the right of the black panel, and uh, uh, kiss kiss two is uh, show us the packet loss monitor, just uh, uh, the file packets loss, and uh, the last case is the pass tracing uh, in the in the left side. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. So let's read me. There's uh do we do that we have the floor is the floor is DNS we're ready for that one yep. and then it looks like uh, l4s will be after that thank you use the left and right button yep okay thank you uh, I will keep I will stand like this. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it tight. Um, the floor is DNS. So the floor is DNS themes. So the, the DNS table was a quite eclectic group of people. It's like the, the DNS protocol probably. So we did something about DNS privacy, DNS support for specific networks, provisioning, and miscellaneous stuff, the, the catch-all. Um, so the DNS privacy work we worked on was zone transfers of TLS, XOT and XUT. So you want to protect your zone, it's uh, encrypted, etc. Uh, XOT is the push model, 
Uh, XUT is a kind of subscription model. Uh, sorry, yeah, it's a subscription model. Um, though proxy plugin for any web server by Petter, it's uh, a fast CGI plugin interface. And there have been some preparations for DOT and DO in Bind. So there's a lot of been discussions on DO in DNS community and uh, uh, beside that. And we think that choice for end users and deployment are important. So I think there's a good work that we include this. Uh, DO support in different pieces of software. Good. Uh, the DNS support for specific networks. So DNS is kind of the Swiss army of the internet. Of course, I'm working DNS, so I'm I'm have some specific view on this. But uh, so for IDL and P presented already, uh, there was some collaboration between Stefan and the INLP group to extend part of the um, uh, implementation of DNS to work with an identifier locator split. Uh, and in some other situations, in the IPv6 only setting, but you have you ask for a quad A. Uh, there's only a, a record, there has to be some middle box, there has to do some translation. So there's the DNS prefix discovery by Mark implemented in bind. Um, again, DNS as a provisioning tool here. So for if you want to do something with any cast and you don't want to create an, uh, a plasma gun for uh, DDoS attacks, uh, you want to have an anycast open resolver with something like a DNS server cookie. So you protect your open recursor for DDoS attacks with spoof ad addresses. Uh, this is implemented in bind and unbound NSD. Uh, another provisioning thing is temporary records in the DNS. Sometimes like the less encrypt ACM of the ACME protocol, you want to publish some information for a short time in your DNS zone. So you're the owner of a domain name for get your certificate, you have the timeout resource record. Uh, after that, the, re the, the information is removed from your zone. Another important thing is the HTTP S SVC. It's kind of a service uh, record. Uh, there has been a long standing, uh, well, problem to solve actually. So how do you provision your web service and how do you address them in the DNS? There have been a number of solutions over the years by the DNS community, by the HTTP community. Uh, and this proposal seems to be received, this re proposal receives positive feedback from both working groups. So it's a lot of interest here and uh, there's, an res oh, sorry, there's an implementation in, in Unbound. The miscellaneous catch all. We did some work on YAML format in DNS packets. The original RFC is actually about JSON. But the original author of the RFC says, well, YAML is fine, it's readable, and it's already in use in the uh, proof of concept of root server measurements framework. That's all. So wrapping up, we did a lot of interop between ourselves, between different groups, the ILP group, the web community. I think we have done some good work. That's all. And these are, yeah. Okay, L4S and then Wishy. Who's the left and right? Thank you. And I want to thank every, uh, the organizers of the whole thing as well. Thank you very much. Um, right, low latency, uh, low loss. Actually, it's low latency, low loss, scalable throughput. Got the name wrong. Um, this is uh, L4S going on in the transport area and uh, TCPM and TSPWG. Right. Um, a bit of background here, but I'm not going to dwell on it. There's um, the where our code is all linked from and the specs we're working to. Had quite a number of people. Uh, we actually expected to have more. Rem uh, nearly all remote and hardly anyone here, but it worked out the other way around. Um, uh, something like seven newcomers, which was pretty good. Um, and quite a few projects we didn't expect. Uh, 
I'll, I'll jump to the next slide and then I'll come back. We did plan something, something that didn't happen with a bunch of people remote that were all new. Um, just it became impractical. It's time in, in India, basically. Um, and um, didn't quite get to finishing, but um, going back, quite a few projects uh, to uh, brought a test bed with us. Um, got that all set up, found there were problems with lin latest Linux kernel, screwing up what we had intended to do, etc. Had to rebuild things, blah, blah, blah. Um, Richard um, got on well with Michael Tuxen, um implementing accurate ECN in FreeBSD um, uh, with Michael Tuxen helping. Uh, there was also, uh, I suppose, the the highlight really was the L4S um, test bed. We had uh, um, the SC people come over and um, give us their um, Flint um, work that they wanted us to evaluate on it. And we started working together on that, which will probably continue during the week. Oh, sorry. Um, and I'll now come on to that. Um, we started the first scenario and we've got the others to do. Um, also, um, the NS3 implementation fast start was added. Richard made good progress on the FreeBSD implementation, which didn't exist before this. Uh, got the handshake and the feedback working. Added the protocol to packet, uh, packet drill. Um, and we built a good w relationship with the SD SCE team. That's we, the L4S team, but now we're we, the L4S and SCE teams. Um, and um, what we learned? Well, DC TCP behavior keeps changing in recent Linux kernels, so I think we're going to have to develop some regression tests for the maintainers because um, it's just impossible for us to use it at the moment. Um, or you have to keep going right back to an early version of the kernel. Accurate ECN, um, we now question one of the, the or the, the most recent change we made to the spec, having tried to implement it, so we may go back on that, but we've got to rethink it. And um, discovered that a counter uh, that crosses a byte boundary, obviously we knew it crossed a byte boundary, but just made it, um, started thinking about cross-compiling and stuff, made it a bit more um, challenging to make sure that would compile correctly. And also learned that remote attendance of newcomers at a hackathon doesn't really work. Yep. Okay, thanks. Okay, where's the wishy? Here's the wishy. Okay, thank you. So this is a report from the WISI hacking activity here at the IETF Hackathon. So WISI, a work on IoT semantic and hypermedia interoperability, is a long-running activity. At the IETF, this is already our sixth hackathon. We are in the including research group, but of course spanning work across multiple organizations and, and individuals. Usually our plan has been finding different ways to turn on and off lights, because that's what IoT is of course all about. This time we had a slightly different focus here. Um, we work on two major topics. One is this IoT data model convergence, so reducing fragmentation, increasing interoperability on the data models. And then hypermedia for IoT, but this time instead of focusing on lights, focusing on making coffee. The specifications included, uh, in particular working on Coral, the constant restful application language that has been in the Tinkleting Research Group quite some time and now moving to the core working group for standardization but also specifications from other organizations. So we've been working actively on the one data model simple definition format, and then also uh, data models from other organizations, in particular OMA spec works like with M2M and IPSO models. On the data model convergence, so we use the one data model simple definition format to do uh, data and model interchange. So the Format is a language that you can use to describe data models from variety of different organizations. And based on those descriptions, you can do, for example, translators between those models, but also able to exchange model, da model data. So bring, for example, models from different ecosystems to your ecosystem. 
We have been working on some automated tools for this purpose. So we have this automated conversion of Ipsos Libotem models into SDF, and we spent some time in the hackathon improving the tooling. And in addition to improvements, we also discovered quite a few potential improvements on the SDF language itself, so on the data type schema and constraints. In the SDF language, we've been using JSON schema for doing the validation of the models, but also after this hackathon, now we have a tool for generating CDDL uh, schemas for the, uh, for the SDF language, and we can use all the CDDL tooling for that too. And as a side result of, of this activity, now we have also a JSON format proposal for Coral, so you can use the usual JSON tooling with your, with your Coral uh, representations. One activity on the data models was this binary data extraction. So if you have uh, something that is not uh, in easy usable JSON format or such, you can now use these tools for extract JSON LD from it. We have Playground deployment available on that, that you can post, post your data and get JSON LD representations back. And the other big one was this brewing coffee with hypermedia. So of course, from the days of hyper, hypermedia, hypertext coffee pot control protocol times, we've been wanting to do this. Now we have modern tools and protocols for this purpose. So you have a carrier grade coffee machine reference scenario, also known as Karsten's coffee machine. You can discover and describe your coffee machine, discover menu options, make coffee selections, and finally get, get some coffee brewed. We have now two open source implementations that use Co-op and Coral to achieve, especially the first three steps, the last one we're still working on. And this is the set of people who are working in our team this time. Uh, we have one new first time member, Michael McCool, uh, and we have two remote participants. If you want to see more information, uh, links, uh, open source implementations, etc., you can go to our, our wiki page and all the information is there. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, I see the um, see the quick. Hi, uh, this is the report from the quick table. We're the big qu table in the middle somewhere. Um, we are also the HTTP3 uh, table uh, because that's kind of the same thing. Um, this is our uh, regular interop spreadsheet. It's getting pretty crowded. Um, so we had 19 implementations that we're tracking. Um, most of them are both client and server. Um, each letter is a test that's either passed or not passed. Um, we now have three lines. The first one is sort of the table stakes, basic protocol stuff. Second row is um, quote unquote advanced features that are, should really be part of the first row, but they're not sufficiently widely deployed yet that we can do that. And the third row is new, which is a bunch of new tests that specifically test HTTP3 compatibility. Um, you see a bunch of white compared to what I showed in previous uh, hackathons. That's because the dash 22 drafts only dropped like maybe 10 days ago. So a bunch of uh, implementations basically didn't have time to update yet. So this, this, should, this should change. Um, but this is the most implementation we've ever had. We keep uh, adding new ones, so it, it's looking pretty good. Most of them were here. Uh, a bunch of people also sent uh, engineers specifically only to the hackathon, and they're not going to stay around for the ITF, which is kind of an interesting development. Uh, so it seems like companies find at least um, more benefit in hackathon than the actual standards meeting. We, sh we should maybe consider uh, in some form. <laughs> um, so I've shown this a lot, so I'm not going to spend much more time on this. Uh, one thing that is also new is, um, I don't know why this shows up like this. So, so there's uh, uh, Jana Yenga and Martin Seaman have done a bunch of work. Um, so I don't know, if, so a bunch of researchers amongst you probably know NS3, which is a network simulator. 
and Jana and Martin have um, worked on uh, allowing you to define an NS3 simulation, so you can define well uh, define TCP cross traffic or topologies, and then you can plumb in uh, actual quick implementations into that topology, and you can do congestion control testing, for example, repeatable. So that's kind of nice. It's kind of cool. It's it's early days. This is the first time we tried this. We plugged in I think two or three different ones. Um, this is a sequence number plus so the, the transfer people will be very excited because now quick starts to look like TCP. You can look at this graph and you see what's going on, <laughs> which was hard before because it's all encrypted. So with endpoint cooperation, you can generate plots like this. Um, this is from the simulator with uh, one of the stacks. Um, we're using Robin Marx's uh, tool. Uh, there's the, def the logging format that's being defined called QLog. He has tools to visualize QLog into something like this. So on the bottom you see like how the RTT changes, that quick things it has over the path, and then you see the regular sequence number ACK plot. So, so uh, this is exciting because finally it means you don't have to be like the, uh, look at the bits anymore in order to understand what's going on in terms of congestion control. So this is very cool. Thank you. Okay, if there's anyone other than TLS 1.3 who has who uploaded a presentation and hasn't presented yet, come up here and see me, and let's go find the TCP 1.3. You saw it. Yeah. Uh, ah, got it. Or TLS 1.3, I said TCP. Brain check. Okay, TLS okay, Go ahead. Bar Barry, can, can you help us with the slides, please? I'm happy to. Just say next slide. Okay, thank you very much. So, greeting, it's um, Logan from Mauritius, from the CyberStorm team. So, we are based in Mauritius. So, we've did, done a bunch of work on TLS 1.3, SSH, SCE, uh, the new DSCP code point, and the ITF mobile app. Uh, next slide, please. So, TLS 1.3, our aim was to get uh, more applications running on TLS 1.3. Um, DSCPLE, it's a new code point that was just uh, that just became an RFC, and we've been working on into integrating that into open source projects. Um, that is the ITF mobile app uh, that we started working um, previous ITF. Then there is the SCE draft um, that came up recently, and then the last thing that we work on was on deprecating RC4 in SSH. So next slide, please. So um, TLS 1.3, we've uh, worked mostly with Golang-based software packages. So Matamos, it's a Slack, uh, Slack alternative. So um, the PR was sent. Uh, Check SMTP uh, is another Golang package, but uh, still working progress. And MINIO, which is for Amazon S3, still written in Golang. Um, we added the, we've added the TLS 1.3 support. And lastly, we've got TLS 1.3 API integrated into PHP 7.4. And the last thing is that we are developing um, a C sharp library for TLS 1.3 called TLS sharp. And it got uh, refactored and it has some support for hello retry and things like that for TLS 1.3 in C sharp. So the other stuff that we've been doing, working on is DSCPLE, the new code point. We integrated the patch, we integrated it into NetPerf. Um, the PR was sent to OpenSSH and it was also sent to NFTverse. Um, the other thing that we worked on was the mobile app, as I said. Um, there are links to the screenshot um, and it's, it has improved compared to last ITF. Um, there's, an, there's a C sharp implementation of SSH that's still running with ARC4, and we've deprecated that. Lastly, we work on um, an SE implementation for FQCODL in FreeBSD based on the draft that um, Rodney and Jonathan were published. Uh, it's still very basic, 
but it's enough that we can see SC packets on the wire on Wireshark. So next slide, please. So what we learned basically was um, open source projects tend to want to wait for new DSCP code points to become RFC before accepting patches. That's the case for SSH, so we wanted to wait. Um, RC4 in SSH is mostly fading away. It's mostly going away. We've not seen that many ca cases of open source projects still shipping with it. Um, SC is just starting, so it's worth looking more into that. Um, there's also other work that is going on with uh, other SC developers. And lastly, uh, Golang 1.12 ships with uh, TLS 1.3 API, so um, expect more TLS 1.3 um, in software packages returning Golang. So last slide. So that's basically us. Uh, we are a whole team here from uh, Mauritius. Uh, we we are grateful to our sponsor, uh, Business Kiosk Venue, who hosted us. And this, those are the links as well to the um, to our repos, where we have some of our results. So for the SC, as well as the code, and for the ITF mobile app, we have it there over that link. And we also included the link for the TLS Shop library. So uh, thank you for everybody for listening to what we've done. And thank you, and it's it's interesting to see an entire project remote. That's that's cool. Okay. Thank you. Anybody we missed? Okay. Thank you, everybody, for presenting, and thank you, everybody, for coming to the hackathon. And Charles is back up. Well, and, and and thank you uh, so much, Barry, for helping with the presentations. It's a it's a lot to go through, and it's it's handy to have have help have a couple people. Um, we're always welcome to welcome more help for the hackathon. Um, we also uh, huge, huge thanks to our sponsors, uh, to ICANN. They really stepped up big, as I mentioned, not only for this hackathon, but for the next two. Um, we'd really love to line up more sponsors for the hackathon because, uh, as you can see, it, it, it's always it, it's it's quite large and it, it takes a lot of money to, to feed us and to have a space for us. And um, great to see that everyone gets so much value out of it. So. If you're at a company or an organization that has the ability to sponsor, um, we'd, we'd appreciate that. And, and thanks to NovaFlow for helping out this time around. Uh, that was great as well. Um, and thanks to all you, really, uh, the, the champions. Um, Al, I thank you for s having your project, uh, welcoming newcomers. We want to continue to make this a great experience for newcomers, too, not just for uh, those of us who have been working on the standards for a long time. So appreciate those of you who did have uh, new people in your team and you help them get started that's just fantastic so um, and thanks for you just uh, paying attention to all the presentations they were recorded we'll have them they were live streamed also so if you miss something you can go and get it afterwards um, lastly if you have uh, you didn't present anything but you still have some useful results to share please do upload your presentation um, to the github org or if you want to you can just send it to me I'll, I'll upload it for you um, if you want to put your PowerPoint presentation there or some other format, that's fine now. Just for up here, we wanted the PDFs. And uh, I think that's it. Um, thanks. Uh, good luck with the rest of the IETF meeting. And as always.